Hello and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. This is Brian Funk, aka Afro DJ Mac. Today's episode of the Music Production Podcast is with guitarist Andrew Whiteman. Andrew plays with Broken Social Scene as well as Apostle of Hustle. And I'm really excited about this episode because Andrew's music has been a big influence on me. It's been the, his, his bands are some of my favorite indie rock bands of the past few years. And uh, he's got some great stories about being on the Stephen Colbert show, Letterman, and uh, lots of different things, his music making, his electronic music adventures. Um, it's a really nice talk and a lot of fun for me. I'm doing this little introduction just uh, because we kind of jumped right in because there were some technical difficulties. Just bear with those when you hear them. It does sound like maybe like a vacuum cleaner entered the conversation or something, but it's really brief, and I don't think it distracts from the uh, overall talk too much. So just bear with those, and I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I had, I had a great time, and thank you to Andrew for giving me the time to have this conversation. So enjoy. All right, welcome to the Music Production Podcast. This is Brian Funk. I make music as Afro DJ Mac, and I'm very excited today to talk to Andrew Whiteman who is here with me from which part in Canada now? Montreal. Montreal, right. Very cool. So, um, Andrew, I want to, again, thank you so much for being, you know, on this little conversation with me. It means a lot. Um, and I've, uh, over the years, really enjoyed the music you've put out with uh, Broken Social Scene, Apostle of Hustle, and now some of your new stuff. So, thank you very much. My, my pleasure, man. So, um, are you on a little bit of an off time now? Um, I'm actually on a bit of a, a starting time. Um, okay. Yeah, Social Scene, we, we've finished our new record. Uh, it's going to come out July 7th um, in North America. And so, you know, Blues Brothers, we put the band back together. <laughs> and um, we did a little sort of warm-up tour in Europe. And uh, that was great. And so we're doing a few shows in the summer. And then um, in September, we start sort of the album cycle properly. So we do three weeks on the East Coast of the States and a week on the West Coast and a few shows in Canada in December hmm. and then Canadian tour. And then, you know, we'll kind of see, see what happens at that point. Wow. So you've got pretty much the rest of the year sketched out for yourself. I got, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like the point where you're just about to jump in the pool, right? <laughs> I have my pool spots actually marked out in the summer. Yeah, nice. we've all kind of locked down a like pool time for sure. Yeah, it'd be good right now. I know we're both sweating it out with uh, <laughs> 90 degree heat. <laughs> yeah. I caught you guys on the Colbert show and it was awesome. So much fun. Great yeah, that was, that, yeah that, was, that was pretty good. Yeah, as good as those can be, you know, because they're pretty cold. It's like oh, yeah. a cold studio. It's uh -huh. cold. It's, you know, it's, you just kind of get up and you're supposed to just do it. Um, but yeah, it was all right. It was all yeah. right. I'm pretty critical, <laughs> self critical of, of, you know, what we do and stuff. But um, that was all right. And I'm glad, I'm glad it went well. Colbert was fun. He shook everyone's hand. What, yeah. can, what more can you ask for? Yeah, right. And is, yeah. is he as much as character um, behind the scenes? would you say or uh you know we didn't really hang we yeah. didn't hang with him but mm -hmm. he was certainly you know just charming just himself you know yeah well i gotta yeah. imagine that's that's a really hectic gig you know you're getting up there real quick doing i i don't, don't even know how much of a sound check you would get and you're just yeah rolling yeah we had a good sound check for sure you know they, they mm -hmm. get all the levels they got to get it all right in the booth and stuff um no you have a decent sound check and then the room is so cold that by the time you get back to actually do the show, your guitar has gone way out of tune because wow. the, the temperature of the room has messed everyone's tuning up. And yeah, it's kind of fun. Yeah, we've done those kind of shows a few times, Letterman a few times. And my favorite time was playing with Letterman when we were able to get Paul Schaefer involved. He took a solo, nice. you know, I'm him because I was standing beside him so I mean that was that was kind of the best one really you know because it's music so you want to interact with musicians you know you want to play right yeah and that's really something with you guys especially the broken social scene I mean I there are well over a dozen people in that act what aren't there <laughs> revolving yeah, there, at least? Can, there can be yeah, I mean you know we got a core sort of core of like five of us and then it expands to like the core people on the road 
add another three musicians, so that's, you know, um, eight. Mm. And then, for example, on this last tour, we brought our old friends uh, from Metric with us, Emily Haynes and Jimmy Shaw. And it was their vacation, and they were just like, hey, I know what I want to do in my vacation. <laughs> Go on a tour bus with our, you know, BSS. So they came with us, too. So we can, we can, we can sort of ebb and flow with who's there. And it is, it can be really fun, you know, especially if you tour with, like we toured with Jimmy and Emily for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so we really kind of had a nice show going on by the end of it. Yeah. Is that difficult for you guys? Like, how do you um, adjust when you have, um, you know, make room for the people that are there and then fill in for the people that aren't there? How does that um, work? Nah, it's not too hard. Because um, there's sort of a, you know, we could for every song, there could be a, pretty stripped down version of it mm -hmm. but because of the nature of the way we record which is you know put a hundred tracks down and scale them all back as much as possible um you know there's always room for a person to you know it's like you know when you watch um you know grand old opry or you watch like country music tv or something like yeah. that and you're like, why are there seven acoustic guitar players <laughs> and hear an acoustic guitar because they're really good at that, like just support, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's always, as long as people are playing heads up ball, there's always, there's room, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool because I know um, from my own experience in playing in bands, it's very easy to um, take up too much space in the band. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to um, rely on having certain sounds and certain instrumentations where uh, the song almost can't exist without a certain number of people doing a certain number of parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true because at our bare minimum, we're going to be five. <laughs> yeah. So there's always, you know, it, it will get covered. Right. But right. for example, we're going to go do um, um, two radio things next week in Los Angeles. One um, morning becomes eclectic. Do you know that one on KCRW? No, 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 no. It's a great great um it's a great it's a great venue it's a great um radio show morning becomes eclectic and it's mm. you know there's been so much it's been so key for indie music over the past 10 years and so we're gonna go do a, a session there and um the, the versions we do will be sort of entirely new and charles um charles spearin one of our core people he has to be he can't be there because he's staying a day late because it's his daughter's graduation so you know today i've been learning charlie's part so if it's really charlie's part in, in a couple songs is integral so there's always a way to pick up pick up yeah. the pieces yeah well it's nice you guys are versatile enough to do that and i guess a yeah. good song kind of stands up on its own even if you strip it down to the most sure. basic elements yeah, it shows you different sides of itself, doesn't it? It's kind of a good test. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know a yeah. song's good if you can just do it on guitar, piano, or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. So that's that sounds like a lot of fun, a lot of good stuff coming up ahead for you guys. Yeah. <clears throat> um, how's um some of your stuff going? I know you've got the project with your wife and... Uh, you, we've we've spoken before about some of your work with uh, some more electronic music. How's all that yeah. going for you? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so Ariel and I, my wife and I, we finished a record, and we're looking for a home right now um, for our project. And that is um, is that Aurora? I mean, it, it, well, it was Aurora. That's what well, that's what we were calling ourselves. But we decided to change the name for a couple reasons. Number one. The 16 year old Swedish sensation named Aurora. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> number two, um, I kind of wanted to sort of phase myself out of my own band with my wife hmm. because um, she actually is part of Broken Social Scene now, too. She contributed a couple of lead vocals on the new record, and, you know, she's touring part of the touring party. So, you know, you're married. You're in one band, you're in another band together, um, and, you know, she really needs to make, she really needs to have her voice heard and stuff. So I, I kind of 
have bowed out as much as I can of that. I think I'm going to kind of take a more Dave Stewart approach. Like I'll make beats for her and I'll like play guitar. I'll do, I'll help in the future. I want to help her, but you know, I think, I think she needs to stretch. And so this, so we've renamed uh, the band. So the band is now called La Force. Um, it's kind of based on, there's a, a tradition in flamenco singing with women flamenco singers often, you know, call themselves, um, you know, La Niña de los Penes or um, what's another one? Like they call themselves like, you know, they give themselves this kind of name, this power name. Mm -hmm. And so La Force is really good for Ariel. It means the force that goes through you, you know, the okay. duende. And so we're looking for a home for this record, which is utterly fabulous. Um, I have no shame and or no hesitation. I think it's a really strong record, um, and it's freaky fresh. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't. F you can't name the genre, I suppose. Oh, cool. You can't, and you can't separate what's, you know, quote unquote electronic or from the laptop, from what's not, from what we recorded just in the room. So that's really fun, and uh, uh, once we find a home for that. <clears throat> we'll probably do some show. And then the stuff I do on my own, I have a couple new projects. One is a, a live uh, improvised electronic music with a couple friends, one one from a band, both Canadian bands, one's called Stars. Um, a guy in that band, Chris Seligman, who plays keyboards. And then another band called Young Galaxy, kind of like an electro-pop band. His name's Steve Ramsey. So we have a band... Uh, we're like, it's called Beta Blockers, and we're kind of like dads. Like, I guess, like, 40 years ago, like, dads would go to the garage and, like, drink some beer and play some CCR tunes or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So our version of that is we get together, we got the MIDI clock, we all lock into the clock, mm -hmm. you know. I bring my TR-8, and uh, I have, like, an S1 and a TR-8. The S1's loaded up with all these, you know, quote, antique synths from Roland, soft synths that you can, I don't know if you know that synth, but you oh, can, yeah. you plug, you know what I'm talking plug about, right? Out, deal plug out, Plug out, and yeah. so I, <laughs> I was totally into it. So, you know, I load it up with, like, a Krumar or an SH2 or something like that, and Steve has his gear, and we just, we record on Ableton, and we just record... We'll we'll um, we'll hang out and we'll watch the sunset go down after the kids have gone to bed and we'll we'll play for an hour and a half, not talk, hmm. and then we'll stop, take a break, and then do it again. And and um, so that's, I mean, that's could be the most fun I have all week. It's uh, you know that <laughs> like it's so great. It's so you know, and he's got that German MIDI clock. Wow. So it's got like you can kind of adjust the swing, or you can really find like where to sit, and that's you know I just because I actually find like joy in the MIDI, like playing with MIDI and that whole thing. Like it's so I found it so bizarre um, when I started doing it a few years ago, and I just couldn't believe it when I was like, oh my god, is that how it works? You have a MIDI clock, and then you have like all these machines are hooked up to it, and then you just kind of go. That's how it, everyone does it. Like <laughs> that that moment of like, huh? That's how it is. And it's just, I guess I'm still at that really naive point, but it's just, it's. I find it so thrilling. You know what I mean? It's yeah, it's I've, a real lift. Man. I had the same experience too because I came from playing with people <laughs> and on instruments and uh when um i got into that and was, you know first it was like through the computer you know doing with like uh, virtual synths and stuff but the first time i ever hooked up a couple things and had a friend over and we put them together and they were working together yeah. <laughs> we were like oh my god we almost didn't want to touch anything <laughs> yeah but it was like this magic like um you know like the machines are alive and intelligent feeling and Really exciting. That's that's the exact thing. And then when we kind of get, you know, you're working on a thing, you're like going through the desert, nobody's really finding it. And then when you start to lock on to something all together and the listing's going really well, 
you hit that moment in the jam when you when you've like oh my god the music is playing itself now mm. the machines are playing themselves like we've kind of nudge them and push them and pull them into certain places and now like i would just you know kind of step back from the machines and now you're like oh my god we we hit the perfect trance like don't touch a thing <laughs> cuz you know you could i could be like wow man i could listen to this for 5 minutes for 10 minutes it's so like if we found the pocket you know uh -huh. so yeah. that's what we're always trying to get to is that place where the machines are just doing it themselves the music is playing itself you know hmm yeah, those are some of the, I find myself getting involved in those jams more and more lately, just with some friends and whatever machine you decide to bring around that day. Exactly. And just really exploring the one thing, getting to know it and uh, finding it. And one of my buddies that I've been playing with occasionally, he's got the System 8 and he's got, he's loving that, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. So, then you're, you're using the TR8, you said, that's the green one that just came out a couple of years back, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I've got that with, uh, you know, a 909, an 808, a 707, and a 606. They're all mm -hmm. loaded in there. So, and you can mix and match the sounds and, it, you know, I'll, I would never be able to afford to find. I'm not, I'm not a real um, collector. I just can't afford that lifestyle to, like, collect vintage pieces and, you know, whatever. For better or for worse, that's not what I do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, having that TR8, when that came out, I was like, this is incredible. Like, you know, I did, I did my review, I did reviewing, and it's, everyone says the sounds are great. Maybe the features aren't, you know, as 100% as it could be, but hmm. good enough for me, man. You know, yeah, yeah. I, you again, like of, uh... with that, going, going to the garage, it's like, well, I got a fake Stratocaster and a couple pedals, and that's good enough, you know? Uh -huh. I don't need any more than that. Yeah, I think it's really easy to trick yourself into that feeling of, uh, I need more, I need this, I need that piece of gear, I need this particular function, which is not available on this model. We're all victims of capitalism, you know, and we perpetuate it, and we're we are victimized by it as much as we adore it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, I really, you know, hopefully we're all, hopefully we're, we're raising the next generation to reject that kind of, like, I need a, my gross... My personal gross national product needs to constantly be expanding. Like that's not really tenable for for the future, you know. So hopefully we're 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 slowly putting the brakes on that attitude. Yeah, well, it's like a story you hear all the time when people uh, make you know the ton of money, they get rich, whatever that means, and they realize that it didn't fill the holes that were in them mm. themselves <laughs> to mm -hmm. begin with. It kind mm -hmm. of exposes them almost. Because now you've got no exactly. excuse, nothing to blame. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, if I had the money, I'd be happy. But now that's not even the case. You, you get well, to, I guess, see yourself in the mirror. Exactly. Exactly. That's what that's what music's great for. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's like a great outlet for me. I mean, I'm ve so uh, 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 blessed right now, you know, um, to be able to have broken social scene going. You know, so I can play and work on guitar and really sort of, um, you know, focus on that and, and playing, you know, delivering really, really, really good shows to people. And then I have this other wonderful thing I do when I'm home with my buddies, um, exploring the world of, you know, improvised techno for a lack of a better descriptor of it. And then, you know, I do what I do by, for myself and for my weird friends, which is just, um, right now it's kind of, it's called sonic poetry. And um, so I'm a big poetry fan, hmm. especially like sort of modern American poetry and what they call, um, you know, the new American poetry, which is sort of a compilation that came out in the early 60s. And so, and sort of the generations that come down from that is what I really sort of focus on and love the most. So there's several places, like the University of Pennsylvania has a place called Penn Sound Online. Mm. And so, and I'm, I've actually, so I go there and I'll find recordings of poets that I love or new poets I've never heard of. And I listen to the recording. And if I start to hear like someone who I've never heard of, that's like just a fantastic poet and like a great like performance or a reader of their poetry, you know, I take, I, 
I download it, and then um, I start to make these, you know, soundscapes for it. Basically, I try and score it. I try and do things. I try and when I first did it, I was essentially using an SP four hundred four, and you know, I would just make some samples on Ableton and throw them in there and various types of beats and sounds and stuff, and I would just kind of do that. And a friend of mine has this thing, Module Eight for video and we we went to Penn Sound we went to we did it in a few places where we would do this sonic poetry thing where I would you know create an hour long program that's when I was sort of contacting you about like how do I play live like you know cuz I wasn't ready to make the leap into like yeah. actually using Ableton and playing live I don't have a push yet you know I I think I'll get a push in a couple years when I feel like I have time to sort of learn a new instrument um so I was just using the SP-404 and an SP-303 to do that stuff. And now I'm not performing it, but I'm kind of honing it. And I hopefully I'll, I will um, just band camp or self-release a record of that, you know, probably by the end of this year. Um, and so that's fabulous. That's where I sort of get my Ableton on. So I have like my guitar, I have my techno, and then I have like, because Ableton, as you know, it's just its own thing it's its own instrument um it's mind-bogglingly huge and once you start digging in you start to see through the internet who the people and who the creators the ableton people throughout the sort of internet universe that you respond to so you know when i was first starting that's how i found you you know mm -hmm. cruising around being like okay this is a vibe i can get with you know um, the instruments you make and sort of the super weird choices you have. And like, it's, it's totally like, oh yeah, I get it. You know, the, the, he's coming from a place that I understand and that I want to go to, you know? And so that is a, that's a really fun freeform thing. I mean, I can, mm. I can do anything in the sonic poetry worlds, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's pretty that's, neat. I've got a buddy actually who does an open mic night around here. And uh, it's called the Music Exchange, and he's learning to use Ableton Live to uh, do exactly what you're talking about, actually, with like a lot of like the spoken word performers and poets, where he wants to just kind of lay something kind of atmospheric and free right. flowing, just yeah. to kind of fill that in. And uh, it's it's kind of cool watching him like discover it and learn, and you put the two worlds together. Yeah, yeah. There's right now, I mean, if people are interested on YouTube, we have a Sonic Poetry channel, and there's three or four videos that are there um, of early sketches that I did. Um, you know, the poet is, there's a friend of mine, she's um, s sort of the, gran the grandmom right now of uh, the beat poets. She's like the youngest daughter of the beat poets who's still there. Her name is Ann Waldman. She's a New Yorker. She's an activist. You know, William Burroughs, like, you know, babysat her son. Do you know what I mean? She, yeah. she founded Naropa College, Naropa Institute in Boulder. She founded that with Allen Ginsberg. Um, so there's a piece by Ann Waldman. There's a piece by the late great Amiri Baraka, poet of New Jersey. Um, I, but what else is up there? Uh, another New York poet named Erica Hunt. Or she might be in um, Oakland, actually. And uh, is there anyone else? There's maybe a couple more things up there. So that's, you know, if you could tip your friend off, show him what I'm doing, and we, we can exchange ideas. Because, you know, it's one thing to, like, lay down a, quote, you know, hip-hop beat and mm -hmm. put poetry on top of it. But that's not really whatever. You do that when you first start, and you're like, oh, my God, it sounds great. And then you're like, ah, uh, actually, no, you know. Let's go a little farther. Let's explore what's happening here. Let's like kind of get into composition and arrangement, composition, texture. Like Ableton puts all these things, you know, at your your fingertips. These all those things, melodic, you know, invention and reversing and inverting, and there's just way too much to deal with. So <laughs> let's get into that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I find myself more and more pl uh, placing limitations on what I'm doing and where I'm going with it. Yeah, like I can't, you know, because like you said, it's almost limitless, endless, and deep, and it's nice sometimes to just say, "All right, I'm gonna play around," like you said, like maybe with some reversed sounds, and see where I yeah. can go with that, or just even yeah. like I want to include a reversed element in what I'm doing, right? And um, use that to um, 
kind of just force myself to get work done instead of just exploring possibilities all oh the time. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah, you know who um another place I found myself watching is um you know Jace Clayton, DJ Rupture, have you heard of him? DJ Rupture, yeah. Yeah, so he um his partner, I forget his partner's name, and his label's called Duddy Arts, and his partner's name had a couple great tips, and one of them was time boxing, which I know you've written about, where you're like, all right, I got an hour. Hmm. That's what I got, and I'm just going to do that, and then I'm done, you know? Or whatever limitations. I mean, they, they did this in writing. Um, in France, they had a group called the Ulipo, which was the, uh, like, ouverture de littérature or something like that, potential literatures, and all the writing in Alipo would be um, highly limited. So, for example, um, one of their writers, a guy named uh, Georges Perec, he wrote an entire book, and all the words, there, there were no vowels allowed. Or, oh, no, how did it work? <laughs> it worked that the E, the vowel E was not allowed. Wow. So he wrote an entire book without the vowel E, and the book was called A Void. And so... It's just kind of like meta upon meta. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, you're only allowed like very highly limited, you know, instructions on how you're supposed to create your art. And that is, you know, anyone who's spent any time with Ableton realizes like, wow, I got to do, I got to put the brakes on. Yeah, you do. Because I'll just spend so much time, you know. As you said, I'll make. I'm going to make a piece out of reverse sounds, only reverse sounds. Or I'm going to make all my instruments are going to be made from like samples of my cat drinking water, like or whatever it is. Like, super important. Yeah, I have an exercise I do with uh, my students. This, as I told you, was the last day of teaching, last day of classes. So uh, yeah, feeling pretty uh, light in the shoulders here today. <laughs> um, I thought it would be a great idea one day. I was like, you know what? I'll just let them write whatever they want. Anything goes. You know, yeah. and that'd be so fun because they can talk about their feelings, their emotions, you know, whatever is going on in their lives. They could write a story about a superhero. It doesn't matter. And I said, okay, guys, today's assignment. You're just going to do whatever you want. Write whatever you want. And I never got so many confused faces looking back at me at once because they're just like, uh. Yeah. And I, then I start figuring, oh, well, maybe they just need some ideas. So I start listing ideas. Didn't work out. What I wound up <laughs> doing was giving them like very strict limitations. Like we, what we did, and, and I think this is a cool thing to do with music too, is we sort of brainstormed like, all right, uh, let's name like uh, five places. We came up five places, the, the, uh, the Taco Bell, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. a basement, um, you know, just come up with a bunch. Yeah. And then it's like, all right, you have to include one of those in your story. And, then, and you just do it. We did, I called it the 555 challenge. I had to use five of these things yeah, um, in three different categories. And then the stuff started happening. And that That's was it, man. such a like eye opener for me because... I'm thinking like freedom equals creativity, but it's really restrictions. No that, restrictions. That's absolutely it. You can't have good without evil. You know what I mean? Yeah. And this ties into the capitalist, my anti-capitalist stance, because, you know, you can't, you, you need boundaries. Like we can't have everything all the time. Like it's just, mm. that ain't right, man. You know, you need limits. Li setting limits is what creates like actual fertility and fecundity you know what i mean in the work and in life like yeah it's really true because you can't have anything get all powerful or too large or too vast um mm -mm. i mean i guess that's why they have like weight classes in boxing and in the ufc you know <laughs> otherwise right oh yeah yeah right right <laughs> You know, you got to have like those confines like, yeah, you, you have to work within this range. Otherwise you have to move to something else. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. <laughs> I guess it applies to a lot of things the more you think about it. But that's where we get inventive. I think is when we have to find a way out where we have to find a way around things and, uh, get a solution. Yeah. The mothers of invention, man. Hmm. I'm, I was just listening to, um, they like remixed uh, Sergeant Pepper's. Did oh, yeah. You, did you see that? Did you get to No, who's they? 
Uh, they, uh, yeah, good question. Like, how do you get that? Uh, I guess you have to be George Martin's son. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my first response would be, how dare you? And then yeah. my second is like, okay, well, you want to go tilt at a windmill? Go ahead. Like, yeah, right. You know, you try if you want to. So you were listening to a remixed version. Well, yeah, it's, I guess, like remastered, remixed. Remastered. Um, I didn't read the literature on it. So, uh -huh. I, you know, someone's going to listen to this and call me out. <laughs> um, but uh, what is cool about it and there's some like outtakes you know there's a whole bunch of um, I guess like different takes of the songs that you can listen to which mm -hmm. I think is really fun mm -hmm. you know, as like you know a person into like creating music and like hearing like where they were and how, how they came from one idea to get to the next was cool yeah but it was a nice experience to just hear all these elements a little bit differently you know, they might even, yeah. be, it's the same performances, but like they kind of emphasize maybe like that Tom drum here. And, and yeah, and it, it was a lot of fun. It was, um, I'm with you where like, I don't want to, uh, fix what's not broken, but it's kind of a fun, I guess, exploration. You know, for sure. For sure. I, went. I have one of those, um, I have one of those double CDs they put out uh, like probably 20 years ago of Beatles outtakes. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it was officially oh, the sanctioned. Anthologies. By, yeah, the anthologies. Yeah. Yeah, and, I've you know, those, yeah. that stuff is fucking gold. I mean, it uh -huh. is really fun to listen to these other versions because the, after whatever, what year is it? 64 or 60? Yes, early 64. They were essentially just a studio band. Hmm. And, you know, nine to fiving it. A lot of the time and that's just it's just fabulous hearing that stuff i mean um boy the samples the samples that are in those things yeah i was thinking that too actually <laughs> listen drums boy they're so <laughs> it sounds so fantastic yeah. you know can't beat the sound of his drums man i know oh. i know well there's a good plug-in um for contact uh oh yeah abbey road drums yeah yeah i have some of those I used to. Uh, I got rid of all the stuff that I stole off the internet, and that was one of them. <laughs> so um, I cleaned it. And, but that's part of our limitations, right? Yeah. Well, that was part of the problem is I spent all this time downloading and learning yeah. how to crack uh, software, and then months went by, and I realized <laughs> I had all this gear I don't know how to use, and I've made no music. Yeah. Good for you, man. That's how that's how it's done. <laughs> that's exactly it. But that's when you're first, you know, you're the rush of like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. But that's great. Yeah, that stuff is that stuff is fabulous. I find myself trying to yeah the same like plugins. God, it's, it's a nightmare. So I, I've picked like three or four places where I get my stuff. Get my stuff from Afro DJ Mac. Nice. I get like my Sonic Couture stuff. You know, a couple of other things. That's it. Sound mm -hmm. toys. That's it. Yeah, sound toys makes good stuff. Yeah, and then you're done, man. What what you know? What the hell are you doing? Yeah, it's so, it's so easy because uh, you know there's always good uh, marketing and everything, and uh, <laughs> there's that like carrot there's that's so easy to dangle in front of the musician. Like, this is where your next hit's coming from. This is, <laughs> this is your breakthrough. I always think of like the music stores offering like uh, twelve month financing. <laughs> like, by then we'll have totally made it, man. Let's totally invest in the gear. <laughs> wow, wow, yeah. Yeah, those That's anthologies cool. would be nice to mill for some samples. I'm telling you, man, there it's rife with samples in there. I mean, and then the, you know, the the stealing, the stealing part of it. Um, I don't know how you feel, but you know, I certainly I don't have any qualms about that, man. Yeah. You know, re repurposing music and taking samples. I know just through me that like it's never gonna. Be what you know. I, I'm never going to be like quote ripping off an idea that I can get sued for. Like I'm not stealing a melody or whatever. But I don't have a problem. Like if I start sampling some fantastic Ringo drum sounds for my next Sonic Poetry thing, who cares? Come yeah. and get me. You know what I mean? I had a I had an argument once um, with my old record label in Toronto, Arts and Crafts. So the last Apostle of Hustle record, which is called Eats Darkness, Apostle of Hustle. I had, I made, there's very early um, experiments with what I'm talking about. So I, I was, I wanted to have like 
skits like they did on a hip hop record. I want to have skits nice. in between these tunes. Uh, so I made little proto sonic poetry things, and it wasn't, I used mostly just sound effects. And I would grab little things, and they would kind of illustrate the song that was coming. And a couple of things, I, one of the things I sampled was um, I sampled the voice of the character Al Swearingen from a HBO show called Deadwood. Oh, okay. And uh, so, oh, and I also, I also uh, sampled um, Polly Walnuts from The Sopranos. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, doing this thing where he's like, uh, snakes, they're both men. Male, uh, hey, uh, you know, Tony, you know, snakes are both male and female. You know, that's why they that's why when you tell a guy, yeah, go fuck yourself, like it's something <laughs> like, and it was my label was like, no, dude, you can't do that, we're gonna get sued. And I, I, I was so angry, I was like, we're not gonna get sued, I'm gonna sell a thousand copies at most, man. No one's gonna hear this, no one's gonna. You know what I mean? Apostle Hustle fans will love it, and no one else will ever care or hear about it. And they made me, you know, they're like, no, no, you got to like redo it, you know. So I kind of redid it, but that's like, I regret it. Yeah, I regret it, man. I should have stuck to my guns and said, okay, well then, let's not release this record. Hmm. Let's, you know, um, and not to be kind of a diva or like tantrum or whatever, but. I guess what I'm saying is that if you have a f- real feeling in your guts about something, you gotta like, you gotta do what it tells you because my guts are saying, okay, then don't compromise what you made because I re- it really mattered to me what I made, you know? And so I said yes and I redid some stuff and it's fine, but I'm still pissed off about it now, obviously, 10 years <laughs> later. Yeah. Why did I do that, you know? You got your outtake version now for the uh, 50th or 60th anniversary or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, I'm kind of with you on that um, about sampling. I I guess a lot of like how I'm trying to approach things too is not really worrying about what's going to happen with it while I'm making it. Definitely. You, You know, let that deal with that later. But like for now, yeah, if we want to, if we're just fooling around, you know, especially if it's sort of like, you know, like you said, your dad jam or something like, like who cares? Like have fun with it. Yeah. And I've had some good experiences where we, you know, we're definitely doing something illegal with samples. Yeah. But it was for no reason other than just to fool around. Yeah. And um, I've even done that like educationally. Like um, I do a, a little music production thing with some of the high school kids and Sometimes we'll just like, you know, it doesn't matter if we're sampling something. We're not going out and putting this thing out anywhere. Everyone's going to hear it. But sometimes I I do get a lot of, um, you know, interesting, uh, I guess, like emails or tweets or whatever from people where they're really concerned over like, you know, is it okay if they do this sample or not? And I don't always have the best advice, I guess, but... It's kind of like just do it, you know. Who cares, you know? Yeah, just, just yeah. hone your craft. And have yeah, fun exactly. With it. Yeah, just just do it, man. Like worry about like the legalities of those things later, because this is just yeah. an accepted practice. Like this is how we make music. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm a musician who like I pay ten bucks a month for Spotify, and we all know how like whatever that you know. I someone would maybe call me a hypocrite. Because like, well, geez, Spotify pays pennies and it's terrible and it's, it's true. I don't, I don't go for that, you know, I don't go for that business model in a sense. Like, you know, musicians ought to be paid for our work. But at the same time, like, I'm not going to fight against, I can't, I can't win that battle. And Spotify's fan, like that service of Apple Music or Spotify or whatever, it's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I'm a music junkie. I'm yeah. still, I'm 50 years old, man. I'm a music junkie still. I, I, you know, I'm starving for it. I listen to it all the time. I got headphones on all the time. I'm, so I can't not, I can't not be part of my times. You yeah, know? That's, uh, I'm into it, man. I, I embrace it and I reject it at the same time. <laughs> I'm full of contradictions as, 
as Walt Whitman says, you know? Yeah. Well, we all are. Uh, it's good to be yeah, at peace with are. that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so yeah, let's just do it. Let's make the work and then see what's coming next and not worry about it. You know, let's just keep trying to push this forward. And yeah. I, I, I can't help but talking about politics all the time. We need to push it forward in cause of the revolution. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, huge bernie sanders fan and i hope somewhere like the new bernie is being cultivated somewhere in your wonderful country and mm -hmm. uh you know there's a few people here in canada that i'm looking at and and i, I you know i i want to put my music and my creativity as well in service of something bigger than myself you know so well, i think a lot of like that stuff those movements it comes you need a pushback you kind of like need a force to work against and mm. um, I think what we saw in in America with the last election, there was like Sanders, Trump were two very, uh, they were the result of people pushing against what was already in existence in two very different ways. Mm. But I don't think you see that without some like, you know, unrest to begin with. Yeah. And yeah, I think... Um, it applies to everything you do. Like once you get that like uh, thing you got to fight against, now you have a, a purpose. You yeah. Have a motivation. We have such a purpose right now, you know, and it is interesting that certain people that were Bernie supporters. I mean, I remember reading this people that were fucking Bernie supporters ended up voting for Trump hmm. just because they didn't want to put the quote unquote liberal elites back. You know what I mean? As, as sadly exemplified by Hillary, you know, um, and although that wouldn't have been my move, hmm. I understand you. It's exactly what you yeah. said. It's these two very different reactions to something, you know? Well, it's, I just and want so, something different. Just yeah, give and, me something different. So, yeah. So our music, you know, potentially, I mean, I'm trying to link it. I'm trying to link things together in my own small way. You know, mm -hmm. uh, my sonic poetry that I'm doing is... The, the record that'll come out, it'll come out under Sonic Poetry or it'll come out under Sound Hustle is another name I, I grabbed on Instagram so no, no one else would steal it. Because um, it nods to my past as Apostle Hustle and it nods to That's just cool. like Ableton in terms of just, it's all sound, right? No matter what you're working with. So I'm these poems that I'm using are by and large, um, you know, awakening type poems energy rising up type poems sometimes pointedly political like as in Amiri Baraka but and sometimes not quite but you know I think it's really important uh, to use these incredible tools like the incredible music we have on hand the sampling every single piece of sound is you know is can be used everything can be used people have fabulous ideas that there's a little series on the Ableton webpage. Um, one more thing, or what's that called? Did you see yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, one thing, right? One thing, yeah. That thing's fabulous. Yeah. I mean, one that's just like a, yeah, yeah, just a few little people just sharing little things, and and you watch one of those, and if it resonates with you, you're like, fuck, that's right, man. I'm mm -hmm. inspired. Let's go, you know? Yeah, it only takes a little drop for inspiration to grow. Yeah, and we need to, and we need something to push against, mm -hmm. and we got it now, man. You know, we definitely have, we got to, I feel like we could have a moment, we could have a moment in the next 10 years. Yeah. I don't have to, I feel like, so I'm excited to see subversive or, quote, revolutionary music can come out of people like us with their laptops and, you know, and our little micro communities online, you know? Yeah, well, a lot of those little communities together is one large one. Exactly. And once those uh, forces align <laughs> and the uh, common enemy. <laughs> well, what's what's the take? I mean, you're you're kind of at ground zero. Like, so what are your kids? What are your kids like? What school? Like, what's the school like? Um, you know, I, I you lost you for a second there. Sure, you... I lost you a second, Andrew. You were asking me what the school was like. Uh... Sounds almost like maybe like a, there's a loose wire or something. Yeah, yeah, it's my, it's my, this is my horrible uh, laptop that sometimes <laughs> holding my headphones in now, so they won't. Okay. Yeah. So you're asking, uh, what's the school like? 
Yeah, well, I'm just wondering where your kids are at because I'm like, I'm like all excited about politics, and I want to use my music in some way to help just, you know, uh, make people, you know, awake. I want to wear. I want. I want things to happen. You know, run the jewels, man. I love this stuff. I'm. I'm a huge Kendrick. You know, I'm a fan of this music. We're ready for this music. We're ready to hear some strong things. I love party music too, for sure. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, um, in general, I think um, when you're in high school, you are caught up in being in high school. You know, that's yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, right, yeah. And I do ninth and 12th grade as of the last few years. I've done them all in high school, but uh, lately it's 9 and 12, and that's a very interesting uh, <laughs> dichotomy because you've got, on one hand, a ninth grader. And when you're a ninth grader, and this occurred to me one day, I was watching them in the cafeteria picking on each other. Best friends, you know, all hassling each other, punching each other, putting things yeah. in their food. <laughs> and you'd go, and they're like, oh, that's my best friend. <laughs> but... um. There's so they're so stuck kind of where they are because they've got uh, four years of their life in this oh, one they're place. Young. They're stuck for the next four years where they are in high school. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, if you or I um, decided that, you know, we've had enough and we needed to start new and change things up, I mean, we could do it. You could pack it all up and move away or quit your jobs or whatever you got to yeah. do. Yeah. Um, these kids will say, oh, Ma, I don't want to go to school. And they're like, shut up, get on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> like you're going. And that's that. There's no outlet, really. There's no escape. So they're really, and when you're 14, four years of your life is what, like a third about of your life? Oh, my God. So yeah. the perspective, yeah, yeah, for it's sure. a long ass time. Um, yeah. So they're really in high school. <laughs> I, I forgot, man. You're totally right. You're right. I remember that now. Yeah, you don't see anything past that. Yeah. But even the seniors, um, they are definitely different, but they're still like, that's still lingering with them. They're shocked now that they're not coming back. But they do start to look towards the outside world. They're a little more curious about it. And I love working with them for that reason because they're kind of wondering about it. So yeah, you'll see like some of them. They start getting like concerned about things that are going on and, and you know, they all have their own issues, whatever it is that they think is important, but they start taking an interest where I don't really see it as much in the younger kids because I don't think they're looking worldview. They're not looking big picture. They're looking, right. you know, what does everyone think about me kind of thing. Yeah, totally, totally. You're right. You're right. You're right. I remember that really well. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like traumatizing <laughs> in a lot of ways <laughs> yeah you if you watch like a couple like 15 year old boys hanging out they're all looking over their shoulder non-stop because they're all fighting for the pecking order and discovering like what does it mean to be a man and half of them think it means just like being a bully or something <laughs> pushing each other around and right. they are always on guard always waiting always suspicious and uh you know, I don't envy that. Like a lot of people say, like, "Wow, to go back and be young, it's it'd be amazing." But I don't know. Sometimes uh, I think I did uh -huh. my time. I'm ready to move on. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel that now, dude. I'm 50. You know what I mean? I don't want to go back 10 years either. I'm like, this shit just gets better, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, your mind expands. You have a wider yeah. view. Yeah, it's uh, the old expression: the youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but um you know it's nice to be able to talk to them about things and just uh, to get them to think you know i love doing that that's why i love my job to just i'm not pushing any agendas i just want you to think a little just explore well I, yeah i mean i think that's the biggest thing that we should be teaching them is critical thinking yeah if they can do that then you can figure your own shit out you know what i mean but that's a skill that you have to learn no one's going to teach it to you. Capitalism does not want you to do that. You know what I mean? The most critical thinking that capitalism wants is for you to know the difference that, you know, this price is less expensive than this one. That's about as critical as they want you to get. So critical thinking is key. You know, you get them to think. I'm sure you have those moments when you see that one kid who, like, you see the aha moment on their face at some point during class or whatever, and you're like, God damn it, I got him. Like, 
you know, that's, I remember the teachers that did that for me and when I was a senior. I do. I, I totally remember it. Once in a while, if you're lucky. <laughs> right. Like getting those tunes that just come. Yeah. Yeah. Half an hour later, you're like, oh my God, I got a whole song. What the hell? It's like magic. It's like you found it almost. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, once in a while, you'll get that. And uh, it's nice when you see a kid. I mean, can, I can count it on my hands in, in the 11 years I've done it where you really see a kid go through dramatic changes. Wow. And um, I had a kid one year who was just failing. He was bright and he was a very interesting kid. When he spoke, everyone listened to him. But he didn't do any work. He was always in trouble. And uh, he actually wrote on his standardized test. He like wrote this whole paper about why the test sucks. He's like, fuck this test. Right. It was like guy. a question about the parks, you know, and he had to write about yeah. the public parks. He's like, yeah, parks are important. You know what I think about the parks? Fuck them. <laughs> and fuck this thing. and then he wrote like a really like you know profanity laced intelligent argument about like why the test was nonsense and from that moment on the kid just changed he just decided that uh he was going to make something of himself you know instead of just being a victim of his situation yeah and i remember just this one day he was uh i was standing outside the hall as the kids are coming in and he's um with a group of friends, they're like, hey man, why don't you come out anymore? You don't hang out. He's like, sorry guys, I've given up on giving up. And walked past them and I was like, Damn. Wow, dude. You're like, oh man, that's the song title. Like, I don't know what that is, but <laughs> that's great. That was yeah. like a lesson for me. You know, that was when yeah, I was a exactly. student. <laughs> exactly. That's pretty cool. There's hope. Yeah, it's out there. There's you know? hope. There's <laughs> <laughs> That's good, man. We need, you know, we need that kid. That's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, it's out there, you know, and they'll come to it when they're ready. Um, there's one thing I learned, you can't give it to them before they're ready, though. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Listen, I know you're, uh, I don't want to, you know, uh, impose upon your time. You've been so generous as it is. And, oh, and on cue, yeah, right? Just that? like that. Yeah, right, on cue. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's wrong. Um well, if you have stuff, like, listen back, Brian, and if you don't have enough stuff, we'll, we'll do another one. You know what I mean? Cool. No, oh, there's I plenty know. here. I mean, I'd love okay. to talk again, too, sometime. But, sure. Uh, yeah, this is great. A lot of uh, nice insights and always fun talking to you. Yeah, likewise, man. Likewise. All right. And there you have it, my conversation with Andrew Whiteman. Andrew's about to embark on a pretty big tour with Broken Social Scene. So if they're in your neighborhood, stop by. Check them out. They are an awesome band, huge lineup, and big sound and great music. So thanks a lot for listening. I appreciate all of your time. This has been a great uh, journey for me as we motor past uh, the 25th episode of the show. If you are enjoying it, I would love it if you could maybe tell a friend, share it online on your social networks, or even give it a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This has been a great pleasure for me, and I look forward to many more great conversations. So thanks again, and have a good day.